Okay, hi, uh, my name is Derek and I'm your instructor for our machine learning and data analytics class. Um, in this video, um, so this is the, the third one here for kind of our big picture chapter on kind of going end to end on a uh, complete uh, machine learning project example, okay? So uh, finally at this point, uh, we're getting into the stuff that we're actually going to be mostly talking about in this course. Uh, so training uh, and fine-tuning uh, machine learning algorithms, right? So the, kind of the main purpose of this course, you know, so, so um, I, as I've already mentioned in the previous video, so, so I mean, the, the data cleaning and acquisition and all those things, I mean, they're very important to a working data scientist. Uh, they can and should be courses all on their own, really. Um, but, you know, so, so we have to concentrate on certain things. So, so kind of our main goal in this course, though, um, is to, to learn about um, the different kinds of machine learning algorithms there are that are out there and kind of a little bit about the internals and how they work, uh, how training works and what meta, meta parameters are and things like that. So this, this will be kind of our first time we're going to be touching on some of those uh, issues uh, here in this class. So. So in terms of the kind of the big picture of, of doing this for an end-to-end -end machine learning project, so when you're doing when, when you're doing your initial evaluation of, of of which machine learning models you might want to use to solve a problem or, or model something, um, you, you'd probably want to start by training uh, a couple of different things, you know, quickly. Um, and then, you know, measure their performance um, and, and, and analyze them, uh, those kinds of things. So we're going to be touching on some of these topics here um, today. So in particular, our main goal here today is to begin to talk about uh, and understand these things about what it means to me measure the performance of, of a model and how we do that um, and how we can do things like analyze um, the, the algorithms to, to understand how they're working and which variables or attributes are being are most significant to being able to solve the problem, that kind of thing. So, um, Once you have a model or two or three in mind, then, um, so if, again, for a real working data scientist, uh, you, you'd want to take that and, and then begin to really figure out how to optimize it to work to solve your problem or um, you know if, if you're a working data scientist you know to make a system that you could deploy in the real world to um, 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 you know solve your business need or whatever right so th this portion is, is all about um, you know once you've narrowed down to a couple models and, and decided on what looks like it might work best in terms of the features for your data set and things like that uh, trying to find the, the correct set of parameters for your one or two uh, models that you're concentrating on, right? <clears throat> okay. So in this video, we're looking at... Um, What I called, um, you know, unit two, uh, third video, kind of in the sequence about training uh, and, and tuning our machine learning projects here. So, um, as usual, I'm going to start by clearing out everything. Uh, oh, in this video, this this notebook, um, if you're following along in these videos, uh, there are one or two models. And, uh, um, um, in fact, maybe I shouldn't have done that because there are some down here that, that take quite a bit of time to, to train, so I'm probably not going to be able to actually run those um, um, and wait for them to complete on the video here. So uh, let's run everything above that, though. Oh, no, let's go down to here. So basically, uh, since I split these notebooks up, uh, you might notice, um, so, so everything down to here now in this third notebook, we're reusing the, the, the pipeline, um, so, so the, the, the transformer that we created to create the, the uh, engineer our features and add the attributes, and then our full pipeline to end up with our prepared data so that we're all ready for um, training, basically. So, um, 
So if I run all these, it'll, it'll do all that. Um, so, so now at this point, um, I should have um, this this, uh, it's, it's actually a pandas data frame called housing prepared. Um, oops. So, um, oh, it's, it's actually, oh, that's right. It's, it's actually a NumPy array. So the result of doing our um, um, transformation um, is, um, you know, through scikit-learn is it, gives us back a NumPy array, okay, so, uh, and I'm, I'm probably not going to convert it back into a pandas data frame because we're kind of done with our data exploration, we're ready to start training models, so we don't have to look at the, the data so much anymore now in, in this notebook here, um, but but we should expect that, um, that um, it has our shape with the 16, again, remember, this is our our training set that we're going to be using. So we've got 16,512 samples. Um, and after our preparation, we've got a, six, a total of 16 features or 16 columns now. Um, you know, so we've got our one hot encoded categorical feature. We've got a few engineered features that we added. Um, and it should be all clean. So we should have, should ever, everything should be scaled um, um, appropriately or that, that should work well for our training. Um, missing data has been filled in and that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, we're, we're finally ready to, to try training some machine learning models, okay? So again, at this point in the course, you know, you don't have to understand the details. Um, we're going to talk about these models. Um, one thing I did want to mention, um, um, sorry, this, um, before I forget it, so in, in this particular example that we're using, the data set we're using, we're trying to predict the housing price. The housing price is a real valued number, so it's a number in U.S. dollars, but but it can take on pretty much any value from, you know, um, so a real inexpensive house, you know, maybe is all the way down to $5,000, $10,000, although probably not, that's probably not true in California, all the way up to, you know, remember, our, our prices are capped at $500,000, so we don't have any data about, uh, they're, they're definitely more expensive homes than 500000 um, in, in California, or, 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 or districts with averages above that in California. Um, but um, but it, it's, it's really, it's a real value number that we're trying to, so that's an, this is an example of a regression problem here, right? So, so we want to form a hypothesis. So when we train our machine learning models, they're going to form a, a, um, a prediction function or a hypothesis function that takes the information, these 16 columns uh, for a district, and then tries to give us one number. So one number in, in U.S. dollars, which is the, the average price that it predicts is going to be what price, houses go for in that district or in a district that looks like a district that has um, these kinds of attributes. Okay? So, so the, the simplest kind of regression, the, the, that's known as a regression problem when you're trying to predict a real value number. And the, the simplest kind of regression model that we'll talk about next week is a linear regression model, all right? So the linear regression, we're going to be using scikit-learn heavily in this class. Linear regression um, from the linear model sub-library of scikit-learn is an example of a, it, 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 it's all three. So it's a estimator, transformer, um, and a um, predictor, right? Actually, it's only two. It's, it's probably not a transformer, so I'm, I'm, I'm wrong about that. So it's, but it's a estimator um, predictor, right? So it has a fit method, and then it has a predict method, okay? So the fit, uh, I think as I mentioned in a previous video, basically is what in, in machine learning is what we talk about when we talk about training the model. So it's going to fit, in this case, uh, this we're doing uh, another thing I should point out, we're doing supervised learning. So the fit function in this case for our estimator takes our input data set and it takes the labels. 
So it, it takes the labels that we're trying to form our hypothesis, our fit function, or, or um, estimator function for here, right? So we'll talk about these next time. So the, the things that were actually fit were the coefficients and the intercept when we when we fit our linear regression here. Okay, so we'll talk about those when we talk about linear regression uh, next in the next unit here. Um, the result of that is a trained model. So that was our first machine learning model that we trained on an example data set. So, so now our next question is, um, is we want to um, evaluate. So how, how well does this linear regression model do? All right. So uh, if we're using data that we've um, not used before, so 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 we might want to test it on new data. We might want to test it on the test data, but but um, if you have raw data that's like of the form before we did any of, uh, any of our transformations, we first have to run it through our full data cleaning and data transformation pipeline before we can perform a prediction. If we don't, um, the, the our trained model won't be able to make predictions on it if it's not in the, 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 the transformed format that it's expecting as input here, okay? So, so yeah, we do that, and then, like I said, um, we, we're just going to use the predict method, okay? So since this is a, um, um, this is what scikit-learn calls an estimator, it has a predict function, and we can use that to, to predict. In this case, we're only looking at, like, Five. We're looking at the first five, uh, so um, so actually here, you know, we have to be a little bit careful. We we might be violating our. Um, if, if you notice here, um, we don't know since we're using our raw data. Uh, some of this data we're using here might have been put into the, the the test set, which we're not supposed to ever actually look at or use, right? Um, but but we're just using this as an example here, so, so we're not really really using it, right? So anyway, so so but we're just looking at five examples of, of districts, um, and we're getting a prediction. So notice, I mean, how, how does it do here, right? I mean, in once I mean it's relatively reasonable, right? So so we get. We get numbers that look about in the right range. So the first one is 280, where the so the first prediction was 210,000 something, where the first label was 286. So it was quite a bit under predicting there. The next one was also a little bit low, so predicted 317,000 for the 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 true labels 340,000. Uh, we had an over prediction for the third one, and so on, right? Um, So yeah, I mean, it's, it's really actually not real great, although, you know, we don't really have a feel yet for, for for how bad or how good it might be. But I mean, you know, the first prediction was off by some 30, almost 40% or so, right? But but yeah, just eyeballing these numbers is not going to be good enough to get, uh, to get a, an accurate feel for how it's performing. So we need a formal measure of performance, all right? So yeah, I, I actually introduced the the root um, mean squared error before, which is what we're going to use to evaluate here, the the mean squared error. Um, so we talked about that in the first video in the, in the sequence here. So so we can use RMSE root mean squared squared error um, to evaluate the performance for regression problems here. All right. So, um, so for example, and, and we can use it to give to give one number of the performance overall for the whole data set. Okay, so here I can calculate. So you know we'll use a function from Scikit-Learn to calculate the mean squared. So notice it's, it's not the full root mean squared error. This this function returns the mean squared error. But if I just take the square root of that, I get the root mean squared error. 
So you want to take the, the square root because it, that, that gets it back into a number that's the same as our label. So we can directly compare the root mean squared error to our, um, to our median um, house price labels that we have. So, um, so this is a single number and, and we're And, and we're, we're calculating this evaluation over all of our data that we use for training. Okay, so notice we get the predictions. We, we call the predict function again, but we get the predictions for, again, for the, the housing prepared. So that's the data that we use to fit or that we use to train um, our model with uh, here initially, right? Okay. So I mean that's important. I'll come back to that. But 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 our predictions here are for the data that we just trained with, right? Um, but we get this number. Okay. So what does this mean? So this this represents our our root mean square error. So this is really the average magnitude of the error that we had um, for our predictions over all of the samples for the data set here. Okay. So it's, it's really kind of bad, especially since you know that the, the, the prices range from like ten thousand to five hundred thousand dollars. So I mean that that represents a magnitude of an error. I mean even for houses of five hundred thousand dollars being off by sixty eight thousand um, on average is, is over ten percent, you know, ten, fifteen percent error, right? So um, So it's probably not really doing very good. Or we, we hope that we can do much better than that. Although, you know, until we start trying some other models or, or, or tuning some things, we, we don't know how much better we can maybe do, right? But this is probably an example of a model that's underfitting. So assuming that there is room for improvement, um, I mean, you know, the, the model when it's trained on all the data um, um, uh, is still, you know, not performing we suspect it's not performing very well at this point. Okay? So let's see if we can improve that. Okay, So let, let's use a different machine learning algorithm. So we'll use a decision tree, which is another one that we'll talk about in this class. So if we, if we fit a decision tree, again, to the whole data set, so we train it or we fit it with the whole data set, now what do we get? Well, um, I mean, you know, that absolutely looks great, right? We get um, a root mean squared error of zero. So that means it's predicting exactly perfectly for all 16,000 whatever of the, the, the data items, okay? So we're done, right? We've got a perfect predictor, right? Um, well, no, not really, <laughs> or else you know, our video would be done at this point, right? Um, the, the, the textbook, you know, is kind of leading you down kind of a Socratic uh, thought experiment here at this point. So you can try and understand the danger of overfitting. So this, this model is, is badly overfitting, okay? The problem is, is that we're evaluating using our evaluation metric, the root mean square error. But we're evaluating on the, the same data that we use to train it with, okay? So if you overfit... Um, and then you evaluate on the data that you overfit with, um, it, it, it can get really good results um, because it's, it's learned exactly uh, what it needs to output for every one of the, the data items that it trained with, okay? And it's, it's easy to have a, a classifier that's perfect on data that you train with. You know, I don't even need a complicated um, decision tree. I, I can just use a, a single lookup table. So I can create a classifier that's going to be always perfect on the data you train with because you just remember when you do the fit, you just remember the, um, the, the input data and you remember the labels. And then if you're asked to um, uh, predict what the output should be, uh, you can just look up. So, so, and if you have it in your data set already, and, and again, if, if you only evaluate on the trained data, you should have it in your data set, and you can just look it up and return what the correct label should be, right? And voila, you get perfect prediction, okay? 
And that's kind of what's, I mean, the decision tree is doing more than that, but it builds a hypothesis uh, that essentially ends up being a perfect lookup table uh, for the data that you're given, and it badly overtrains. So it can do perfectly well. In fact, it can predict perfectly for the training data, but that's not a good measure of, um, of performance. Okay. So the real question we have to ask is, if you want to really know how it's doing, if I give it data that it's never seen before, if I give it data that it wasn't trained with, would it still be able to give perfect predictions? That would be a good classifier if it's perfect or near perfect, but it, it, it can do that with data that it's never seen before. Okay, so you might be thinking, "Aha! That, that's why we've got the, the test data set." Okay, but that's not quite exactly the purpose of the test data set. Okay, so we're not going to use the test data set yet. We're going to keep the test data set held back, uh, but we need a similar idea. Okay, so this gets us into the idea of cross-validation, all right? So we're going to use our training data set, but we're going to, again, split it up into two sets, okay? So, uh, so we can use, um, so we can train on only part of the data and then evaluate our models on the data that we didn't train with, okay? So, you know, when we did our test train split, we, we had a similar idea. We're doing the, the same kind of idea here, but, but we're still, we're holding off that test set for a final overall evaluation. But we want to do another split now into what's known as, as our training set and a validation set, okay? And in order to evaluate um, how well our model can generalize, normally what we do is we do what's known as K-fold cross-validation, so, for example, just to make it concrete, so, so we might split our data set up into 10 pieces, 10 as equal size pieces as we can get them. And then what we would do is we would train our model 10 times, right? Um, and, and, and so each, time, each of the 10 times, we would hold back one of those 10 what are called folds, and we would train it with the other nine. Uh, and then we would evaluate, you know, using the root mean squared error, um, we, we would evaluate it on the data that we held back that it hadn't seen before. So in that way, we're able to get 10 results of how well it does where we train it with, with 10 parts of the data and then evaluate it on one-tenth of the data that it's never seen before, okay? That, in a nutshell, is K-fold cross-validation, and we'll use it repeatedly um, in this class, right, um, to, to evaluate our models as we're trying to tune them and see how well they work. So, um, so Scikit-Learn makes using K-fold cross-validation, you know, it, it takes all the grunt work out for you, so you can call basically a single function uh, to do K-fold cross-validation, right? So here, we'll use our decision tree regressor but we're going to train it with um, um, a, a tenfold uh, cross-validation, right? And the result of this will be we'll get back ten scores, okay? So notice we're also we're, we're, getting, we're using the mean squared error, although um, for technical reasons that I'm, I'm sure I couldn't tell you why it does this, um, but it uses... Um, it uses what's known as a utility function where greater is better rather than a cost function, okay? So the root mean squared error is a cost function where it's smaller, you know, the closer to zero, zero you are, the better, right? But we can turn it into a utility function by just using the negative of that. So that's kind of what we do here. So then, since, since, since negative mean squared errors are going to be further from zero, it makes it into a utility function, so... Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end, to, to convert these scores back into root mean square errors, we can, just, we can just take the negative of those scores and then take the square root again. And that will give us our um, root mean squared errors from these scores that we get from our tenfold um, cross-validation here. All right? 
So um, that doesn't take too long, but, but yeah, again, to do this, this K-fold, when we have a more complicated model than decision trees, uh, it can start beginning to take a bit of time. So. so let's see how the decision tree actually performs. So now we've got 10 scores where the score, and again, the, the default, and this is what you really want, you know, the, the, what we're going to be getting back is the score on the data it wasn't trained with for each of the 10 times. So, so the fold that was held back um, is, is, what the, is what the root mean squared error score is that we will end up getting here, right? So, I mean, these were the raw scores, um, and this was the mean and the standard deviation. So now, since we have 10 scores, we can also get a feel for what the variation is. So, so if I end up training with a different set of random data, um, how different am I likely to get in terms of the, the average performance for different classifiers, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, here now, though, the, the, the decision tree doesn't look so impressive. In fact, it's, it's probably worse or probably the same or maybe just slightly worse than the linear regressor, which is a very simple model here, right? Um, although we didn't, we didn't train the linear reg regressor with k-fold cross-validation, so it might fall a bit. So yeah, here we, we just go back and redo the linear regressor with k-fold validation. Um, so its average, yeah, again, was, was a little bit better. Um, so... Um, so, and, it, and again, kind of a final note here. So even though the performances were about the same, if you just look at the mean and also at the standard deviation, um, um, these models are both bad. Well, they're, they're, they're both relatively bad, but for very different reasons, okay? So, and I know they're bad for different reasons because of when, when we looked at their, their performance on the... Um, on the original data set that they were trained with, okay? So the decision tree is bad because it's badly overfitting the model, uh, whereas the um, linear regressor is bad because it's underfitting, right? So uh, the way we fix those is going to be different in, in, in different cases. So, um, and we're going to talk more about this in the class later on, so I don't want to go into lots of details here, but we would fit the over, overfitting model by um, adding in some regularization and, and tuning some hyperparameters, um, and we would, fit the under, we would fix the underfitting model by loosening up some constraints and doing some other things. So. Okay, so one last model in this first section. Um, so we might try a random force. So a random force is even a more powerful model. Um, and I think that um, I can still do, uh, this might take a little bit of time, so I better go ahead and get it started here. Um, so if we do tenfold, tenfold cross-validation, so uh, and now I think about it, I might stop my, my video and, and restart um, and so I can let these kind of train here. So let's go ahead and... and, and um, and uh, try and do our random force. So random force, again, this is another model that we'll talk about in this class. It's really a collection of multiple decision trees, thus the forest. So it's a collection of trees. Um, um, so in theory, a random force should be more powerful than a decision tree. Um, and the final result here is that um, it, it will do actually significantly better, um, although um, at the end it, it, it reduces from about 70 down to about 50,000 um, for the mean, you know, which, which still is not really great. 50, a 50,000 error uh, is still, you know, 10% even if, if we're at like $500,000 houses, right? So the error still looks maybe kind of big, but, but it's, it's quite a bit of improvement over the first two models that we had. So this is our first um, um, indication that we might have, that we might be able to find some models that can, um, you know, improve the overall performance here for our prediction, okay?
Um, okay, so yeah, like I, like I said, I'm going to go ahead and quit the video, and then we will come back, um, and uh, once this is done training, so... Okay, so uh, back with um, when we're done training with this first, um, slightly more significant. So later on, we've got some even longer ones. So I'll just stop the video um, uh, more quickly um, for, for the next ones here. Um, but um, you won't, you might not get exactly these same numbers because there is some some randomness um, happening here, especially for like a random force. So it is it is a stochastic um, uh, machine machine learning algorithm here. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, you know, notice, so the mean was significantly um, improved. So that was a $20,000 improvement. So that represents, you know, 20 out of 70 or two sevenths, you know, so uh, over 30 or 40% improvement there. So that, that's why we were kind of happy, relatively happy with that. And notice the, the, the well, you know, the, the variation isn't too bad. It's gone down a little bit. So. Um, okay, so now on to the second part. So, I mean, you know, once you have an idea, and, and so this first part, you would, I would probably try more models now, actually, you know, so see how it works with SVM, maybe try, you know, uh, a neural network, some things like that, okay. So once you've done that, though, um, we have an idea of which models might be promising. Uh, we might want to pick one or two um, and start more um, systematically searching uh, to, tr to try to optimize them. Okay, so um, Scikit-Learn gives us a couple of tools to do. This is what's known as parameter tuning in the business, in the machine learning business. So the, the two main ones that, that we'll use in this class, uh, either a formal grid search or just a random search. I didn't have an example of random search here, although I think you might have had it in the textbook. So a grid search is, is just basically, so, so let's... Um, so, so let's say for the random, for, we're just going to concentrate on the random force regressor and see if we can improve it any, okay? Um, so there, all these models that we're going to look at in this course, they'll have what are known as metaparameters. So when you first create, uh, we didn't use any parameters, um, uh, we just selected the defaults. Uh, but, but yeah, when you first create the instance of your object, your machine learning algorithm that you want to train, uh, you can set these metaparameters, like the the number that, that we're going to be doing right here, the um, uh, what were they? the the number of estimators, the max features, and things like that. So I, I could have set that, but if I want to systematically explore these, I can use a grid search. Um, so basically, all you do is pass it in dictionaries, um, and and each one, each dictionary, um, perform special makes a group here. Okay, so in this first case, we're gonna try all the different combinations of of these different numbers of estimators and different max features. Okay, so since there's three estimators and four max features, we're actually gonna create twelve. Um, uh, 12, we, we're, we're going to train 12 models with all these possible different 12 combinations of estimators and features here, right? And then likewise here, so every one of these dictionaries is going to be a different group, but it will do all these together. So in this case, there's one feature by two by three, so there's going to be another six. So in total for this grid search, we're going to do um, 12 plus six, uh, which is uh, 18. We're going to train 18 models, okay? Um, so here, and again, you know, it's doing a lot of grunt work for you uh, uh, down here. I mean, you, you could do this all by hand, but you'd have a lot of code to reproduce this by hand. But but we're going to do a, a, a random forest uh, regressor. And the grid search CV will, will do cross-validation um, and it will it will do it eight time eighteen times. So it will do train eight do eighteen cross validations for our random forest. 
here, we reduced the cross-validation split, the, the number of folds down to five a little bit this time. All right. And the result will be, um, we, we can get the result, but the result will be, um, it'll keep track of the things for us. I should probably get the, go ahead and get that started, so this will take some time um, as well. Um, but this, this, um, this object, um, you can, you can inspect to, to get things like to find what would end up being the best parameters for all these combinations of parameters that it will look at. Uh, we'll be able to use this to, to get out which ended up being the best parameters that found on this grid search, doing this here. Uh, you can get the actual best estimator. So this will be an actual um, um, random forest regressor that we can then use to evaluate. All right. um, and you can get the scores out of the, um, the, the cross-validation results. So like we did before, we're using the negative mean squared error. So um, here at the end, we can report um, all the results. So uh, they're actually went faster than I was expecting there. So, so we're done already with our um, grid search, um, cross-validation grid search here. So, um, so notice what this means here is that the best combination parameters that found was from the first one um, where we had six max features um, and the number of estimators was 30. So, so this one here. Um, so one note on that, I think, I, think I, I mentioned this somewhere here in this notebook. So since we all, since 30 was the maximum we tried, we, we might want to expand our grid search so we have number of estimators bigger than that. So we might be able to find even better if we do if we explore that meta parameter in that direction. So it's so bigger than that so, since we found our best when we maxed out number of estimators here. Um, and like I said, this is our actual instance of the random forest regressor that did the best. And we can, we can display all of our scores. So this was all, this, this sh there should be 18 of our scores here. So this was all 18. Um, um, random forest regressors that were created, and that was the mean here. So one thing to note, though, um, although uh, we did find something that was a little bit better, it didn't do a whole lot better. So we reduced from 50,000 to just under uh, 49,000. So, um, so this, this, this example was more for illustrations. It, it, uh, it maybe improved a little bit, but, I mean, there is some hope. So maybe if we continue, for example, trying some more number of estimators or some other matter of parameters, uh, we might be able to get this reduced uh, quite a bit more. Um, okay. So once you start fine-tuning your model, uh, another common thing to do at this point is to begin doing some analysis on uh, what the features are doing, how the models are working, um, why, you know, so, so, so we want to get a better, basically we, we want to get a better understanding of, of the models and, and why they're failing. So that might tell that might help tell us um, either which meta parameters we, we may need to tune, or it might give us some insight into going back to uh, re-engineering our data features to get per better performance out of our models. So, um, so one thing, one reason why we picked a random forest. Uh, so not all machine learning um, algorithms. Can do things like this, but uh, random forests have this nice feature that this nice property that you can actually get an estimate of which features were most important and least important to the trained model. So if we look at our best estimator, uh, we, we can introspect it to find out, um, you know, the, the, the features that we use. Okay, so in this case, you know, as we are probably not too surprised, the median income was the most important feature um, that was used for the, the best um, trained uh, random forest here, right? Uh, but the second most important feature um, was the um, one of those categorical features, the, the inland, okay? And this was kind of a, 
um, a numerical estimate of how important that feature was to our final um, estimator, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, we, we never looked at the um, correlation for our categorical feature, but you know, one of the categorical features ended up being helpful, at least to the random tree um, um, regressor here. Um, notice our bedrooms per household end up relatively high up the list, so both of these are doing about the same, although longitude and latitude um, are kind of being used by the random trees. So again, that's just because of, of, of the Los Angeles um, um, location for high-priced high housing houses here. So. Um, Okay, and and yeah, and that's it. I mean, you know, we would do and we would do a, a lot more uh, here, um, and we would keep reiterating this, right? So so from these results, um, if I was really doing this step, I would go back, uh, maybe continue my grid search, uh, maybe pick my next promising model, and also do some grid search with it, so we can compare and that kind of thing. All right. So, um, all right. So and then then kind of as a final step here. Um, so you wouldn't you wouldn't go on to this ne this step here until you finally decided on I've, I've done as much tuning as I can and I don't think I'm gonna get much more performance so as, as a final thing before we go up in like maybe deploy our model or write up our scientific paper with the results from our model um, is we would finally pull off that test data okay so as a final thing that you would do is 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 um, um, we, we would do a final run with our full set of test data with, with the best model that we had. Um, um, and, and perform a prediction. So notice, um, so normally you would expect your final um, evaluation to be probably a little bit worse than what the average that you got from doing your tuning in your metaparameter search because often usually your model is going to end up being a little bit over um, overfitted um, for the data right? but in, in this case we actually um, performed um, surprisingly well, well a little bit better than, than the average that we saw but that can happen right the other thing about this though um, and that, so your final thing is here, you, you're going to want to evaluate um, what you expect, how your model is performing on real data, that it's not saying or real new data that, that might be coming in. So one thing, again, if you, if you know some things about statistics, we can do some things like um, calculate uh, confidence intervals, right? So, so from this and, and from the variation that we see on, on how the predictions perform so so how far off they are we're going to be able to, to, to calculate confidence intervals so this will tell me for example that I'm 95% uh, confident that my true average is going to be somewhere you know my, my true average performance um, average error so th this is an average error a root mean squared error here so my true average error is somewhere between 46,000 and 50,000 uh, dollars on real unseen data, uh, most likely. Um, I mean, I'm 95% I'm confident that, that, that my true error is somewhere in that range, basically, right? So that's what it's telling you for. So, so final statistics can be very useful here. So this, this will give you an idea of whether this model is going to be able to work in production or, you know, if I'm writing a scientific paper, whether this, this, these results are significant or not, you know, or significant improvement or not. Um, over past um, models in, in the scientific literature. So, um, all right, so that's it for this video. That, that was just a real quick kind of thing. Like I said, most of the rest of our course, we're going to be doing this over and over. So, so um, looking at training and evaluating and then tuning models with various parameters on various data sets. All right.
So, um, that's it for this video, um, and I hope that, that that was useful, and I will see you guys then in the next video.